Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. Do we tighten it some more now or just wait for it to turn black and fall off? The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Materialism, Addiction, and Sadism. Tonight, we will follow the life of a criminal bride caught up in the affairs of her many affairs. We will see a near stereotypically perfect example of a modern Libertonian woman whose ambitions for living a comfortable, pampered existence would come into constant conflict with her fleeting attention span for love. I love you, Tony Cipriani! A proud and occasionally eager participant in crime herself, tonight's subject is a woman who you most certainly do not want to end up on the wrong side of, if only for her most powerful criminal connections. We will see thievery, marital assassinations, and ambiguous love affairs as we document the known criminal history of Liberty City's own Maria Latore. This episode of Grand Theft Auto Biography is brought to you by my incredible supporters on Patreon. My goal for this channel is to be 100% fan funded, allowing me to cover whatever I want without having to rely on AdSense and appeasing the copyright gods. If you want to help this channel, you can donate below with the paypal.me link in the description, the YouTube thanks button below the video, or you can sign up on patreon.com forward slash Guinness Walker and get early access to all of my work, access to all of the music for my shows and permission to reuse them in your own work, a download catalog of every video produced for the channel, access to the patron-only Discord server for weekly game nights slash movie nights with me, and your name in the credits. Help me reach my season 3 goal so I can continue producing shows for you guys for a long time to come. Thank you for watching, and enjoy the show. Maria Latore was born presumably in Liberty City in the late 1960s or early 1970s, though exact dates could not be obtained in our investigations. In fact, whilst we believe that Maria is a Liberty City local, we do not know this for a certainty. However, based on her very thick Libertonian accent, it seems at the very least fair to assume she spent a significant amount of her childhood in the worst city in America. No information exists on Maria's childhood or the identity of her parents, though it is assumed by this program that they were first or second generation Italian immigrants, or at least trace their ancestry directly back to the old country. Being an Italian-American woman in Liberty City, Maria would be no stranger to mob violence, and, we speculate, spent a majority of her youth and young adulthood surrounded by the all-too-common machismo of the American Cosa Nostra. It isn't clear exactly when, but at some point, Maria would also become acquainted with a high-ranking Yakuza member, Asuka Kassan, though the exact nature of their early relationship remains unclear, with some speculating that theirs was more than a friendship, and may have even been romantic or sexual in nature, though once again, this isn't confirmed. Eventually, though, Maria would find herself fed up with life and liberty for any number of reasons we can only guess at. Sometime prior to 1992, Maria would move to Las Venturas and begin looking for legitimate work as a server at one of the Strip's many fabulous casinos. Unfortunately for Maria, due to her heritage, bad luck, or just bad habits, she would once again find herself surrounded by Liberty City mobsters, seeking to turn the jewel of the desert into yet another criminal asset. By 92, she would find work as a waitress at Caligula's Palace, a mob-owned casino that was being run as a joint venture between the three Liberty City families. Quick enough, Maria would be introduced to the infamous boss of the Leone family, Don Salvatore Leone, who was at the time we believe in his early to mid-50s, while Maria was in her early to mid-20s. Intrigued by Salvatore's money, power, or both, but evidently little else, the two would start dating, while Maria worked the casino, and Salvatore attempted to turn his joint venture into a sole proprietorship. 
Well, well, well. What do we got here? Here's your sandwich. Who's this pretty thing? I don't usually do this kind of shit, you know. <laughs> I like this girl. What's your name, kid? Maria. And the service is not included. I ain't the woman, you fat fuck. You heard the bird. Come on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? See you later, guys. Maria would continue seeing Salvatore during his brief stay in Venturas, but remain relatively distant from Salvatore's various business dealings, which saw him employ the likes of such notorious criminals as Carl C.J. Johnson. Though never formally introduced, Maria would meet Carl at least once, when Salvatore hired him to perform a hit on Franco Ferrelli at the St. Mark's Bistro in Liberty City. Just feel the weight of the weapon, sweetheart. <laughs> I can feel the weight of someone's weapon. Hey! You don't want to blame on that front. Can I fucking go now, or fucking what? Ooh, you fucking twat! Right in the fucking happy sack! Perhaps you'll be cured of your little anti-social condition, mate. Carl, it's my man. Mr. Leon? Looks like this piece of shit was right. You did a real number on those Ferrelli losers. Now it's time the Ferrellis found out what it means to screw with Salvatore Leon. How would you like to hit the St. Mark's Bistro? A hit in Liberty City? Cool. But I'ma need some backup. Take who you want! Well, I usually use these two. Hey, hey, remember all those jobs we did together? Huh? Huh? You and me, Carl, remember? Huh? You know, you used to call me Killer Ken. Ken the Killer? Killer? Ice Cold Ken. That's me. And him too, I guess. Though Maria may have grown to enjoy life in Venturas, her new man's business venture would end in one of the most elaborate and well-documented casino robberies in the history of San Andreas, wherein Salvatore was for once the victim and not the perpetrator. With Caligula's near bust, Leone would see fit to move back to Liberty City and return to managing his empire from home, inviting Maria to accompany him, and at some point even proposing marriage to the young waitress. It isn't known when or where Maria and Salvatore married, but our investigative team speculates that it may have taken place in Las Venturas mere days or less before their departure for the East Coast. Given the city's reputation for shotgun marriages, and the always fleeting nature of Maria and Salvatore's relationship, we find it unlikely that a large, elaborate ceremony was held. But one must also remember that both Leone and Latore were Italian-American, and therefore may have partaken in such festivities simply out of tradition. Though the marriage would obviously take place, it would be against the wishes of Maria's father, whose identity remains unknown. All that is known is that he strongly disapproved of her being with Salvatore, whom he referred to as a fat slob. Whatever the case, we know that for certain, by 1998, the two had been married for some time, several years at least, leading us to believe that whether in Venturas or Liberty, their vows had been given in 92. Marriage can be a tricky course to navigate, and for a woman such as Maria Latore, the life of a happily married housewife would not be one she either aspired to, or even desired, it seemed. After a presumably very short honeymoon period for the couple both literally and figuratively, they would seem to quite quickly devolve into angry bickering, occasionally physical scuffles, and frequent infidelity from both parties. Clearly only with Salvatore for his wealth and influence, Maria would show almost no true affection for the elder Leone boss, and by 1998 was not only living on her own in the St. Mark's apartment, but was consistently sleeping with other men, a fact that even her husband was well aware of. Though himself prone to infidelity, or at the very least, frequent visits to strip clubs, Salvatore would take Maria's lack of loyalty personally, but never have the heart to outright cut her off, and continue to support her lavish, materialist lifestyle by providing her with the aforementioned apartment and plenty of money to waste on frivolous things. In addition, Maria at some point in her life would develop an addiction to speed, among other drugs, and begin buying it regularly from dealers at great expense to herself, even to the point of winding up in debt to one dealer, to the tune of possibly $100,000. Despite Salvatore's attempts to keep Maria from leaving outright, the two's inarguably toxic relationship would be enough to make Maria at least consider selling Leone family secrets to journalists such as Ned Burner of the Liberty Tree, though as far as we could tell, she never followed through with these threats, mostly due to a disagreement regarding payment, which she'd intended to use to pay back her speed dealer. From archived emails that our investigative team was able to retrieve, Maria wrote, Hey, I got your email from this guy I know, but that's not important. 
So listen, I heard you wanted some information on the workings of organized crime in this town, and were prepared to pay for it. Well, what I'm saying to you is that I am seriously connected in that world, and could have you killed in about five minutes. But if you offer the right price, then I'll tell you everything. And I mean everything you need to know about the Leone crime family, about the Ferrellis, and the other guys. And trust me, I know the truth! But I need money, and not a hundred bucks or something dumb like that, so uh, how much can you pay? I need the money, and obviously I mean cash, I'm not a bank, but I owe someone money who is also not a bank. In fact, he's a speed dealer, and not a nice one. Get back to me, and maybe we can do some business. Trust me, you'll not regret it. Hey, Mad Maria, good to hear from you. What did you have in mind? Of course I'll pay for information, but I need evidence. I'll have to be able to run a real story. That's how the press works. We only make it up when the people we are talking about won't have us killed. If you can get me real evidence, I'll pay big, 10,000 at least. Do we have a deal? Get back to me. I can be trusted. Yours, Ned Burner. And finally, Maria responded with, Ned, 10 grand? What do you think I am? A coke whore? Is that it? I mean, really. I spend 10 grand on lunch. Often. I hardly do coke ever, aside from at breakfast, so that ain't the problem. I told you, I owe my speed dealer a lot of money. 10 grand ain't enough. Now let's make it 100. Okay, so this is it. Are you listening? You'll be glad you spent all that money on this. Salvatore Leone ain't all the man he's cracked up to be. I heard from someone very close to him who was not a liar or a coke whore, thanks very much, that sometimes he can't even get it up after he takes those blue pills. And also, that his right-hand man, Vincenzo Chili, is not loyal to him, or doesn't respect him. What about that? That's a story in itself. Plus, the Leones are planning to take over the whole town. So come on, Ned, give me the money, or I'll get mad. But you didn't hear it from me. As far as we are aware, this interaction ended with Maria's demanding of $100,000 from Burner, who was unwilling to meet such extravagant demand. However, given that Maria seemed completely forthcoming with her information, it seems fair to assume the only reason she didn't get Salvatore and his organization in more trouble was due to her own incompetence, and not a lack of trying or motivation. When Salvatore's soldier, Tony Cipriani, returns to Liberty City in 1998, following several years in hiding, she would almost immediately become interested in him, and much to her own delight, get plenty of opportunities to see him, when Salvatore orders Tony to watch over her while she went about her various errands. Is this one of your new doggies, Sal? Mr. Leone. Tony, come esta? I'm glad you showed up. I want you to do something for me. You're late. Typical man. I want to go shopping and you're driving. So help me, I'm gonna have some fun today, even if it kills you. I just need to finish getting ready. And eh, screw it, I'm gorgeous. Come on, Tony. However, a woman like Maria Latore rarely allowed for life to be boring, and despite Tony expecting to chauffeur to several shops for hours of mundane shopping, that would not be how his day would play out. Instead, Maria would attempt to shoplift from the Portland View branch of the Signora Grande Italian Boutique. Wait here, sexy, I won't be long. But I just wanted to see what it looked like in the daylight. I'll Take your goddamn man. hands off me. When chased out of the establishment by the owner, Tony and Maria would be forced to flee the police before Maria demanded that she be brought to another store on the edge of Chinatown, fleeing the store yet again when caught by the owner, who was more than prepared to dish out his own justice. Keep the engine running. Come on, Maria, no more stealing. Oh, hush, Tony, baby. That was all a misunderstanding back there. I'm telling you, I don't have anything hidden up there. Get the hell off of me. Thief! Maria and Tony would be forced to flee the scene of the crime, and it's possible that Tony even killed the clerk who threatened them, but this is unconfirmed. After his first encounter with Salvatore's wife, he would perhaps gain a deeper appreciation for just how their marriage had reached the rock bottom it was clearly at. Tony, honey, I had a great time today. Maybe you can drop by later and we can have some more. See you later, handsome. Unfortunately for Tony, to Maria, fun meant meeting her speed dealer in Chinatown for another night of being wasted. 
It would thus prove a wise decision on Salvatore's part, or in retrospect, quite the opposite, as Maria would discover her dealer had plans that went far beyond just scoring a bit of sugar. Stop it! One of Salvatore's dogs is bringing me right over! Oh, he's a charmer! Maybe too thin, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, listen, I want a party, but the cupboard is bare. You got some sugar? Pure cane, huh? Great. Ciao. Come on, Tony, I got places I need to be. Upon arriving at the meet, Maria would be greeted not by a friendly bag of mind-altering substances, but instead, a group of Sindaco thugs, who would promptly bag and tag the vulnerable woman, attempting to kidnap her for presumably an enormous ransom to Salvatore. Thankfully for Maria, her new bodyguard and Tony Cipriani would be on the case, and with relative ease managed to stop the escaping vehicle and kill all the Sindaco soldiers trying to make away with her. I ain't going anywhere with you. Who the hell do you think you are? Try. So, uh, you want to come up for a uh, coffee or something? I'll pass. You sure? Well, call me. But despite the obvious dangers to her life of partying, hard drugs, and associating with violent criminals, none of it would be enough to deter Maria from making bad decision after bad decision. One such decision would be shortly after her kidnapping, when she decided to put herself up as a prize in a motorcycle race around Chinatown and Callahan Point, possibly all in an elaborate attempt to gain Tony's affection, which unsurprisingly, falls flat. Dear Tony, I've put myself up as the first prize in a street race. If Salvatore finds out about this, we're both going to be in big trouble, so you better come and save my ass. Then maybe it'll belong to you. Forever yours, Maria. Tony would win the race and plead with Maria to return to her apartment safely, but the rebellious and free-spirited woman would choose instead to leave with another contestant in the race, Elsie Biker, Cedric Wayne, father and gay. Come on, Maria, let's go. Well, finally, <laughs> Mr. Tough Guy makes this That's move. Bullshit, yo. Look, Maria, you're Salvatore's girl. I'm my own girl. You're such a goddamn square. Come on, Wayne, let's party. Unsurprisingly, Maria's fling with Wayne wouldn't last long at all. The two would party together, taking hard drugs and apparently having wild sex, until Maria confessed her love for Tony to Wayne, eventually winding up back at her apartment, weeping in dramatic fashion to try and win Tony's affection. <laughs> ah, what have you taken now? Nothing. What was it this time, huh? Smack, downers, lewds, uh, a little too much trumpet, not enough diazepam, a little too much sideways, not Shut enough up. up. Tony! Who did this to you? No one. Who was it? This guy I'm seeing, Wayne. Oh, some guy you're seeing. You're my boss's girl. Shh, come on, Tony. Don't be so square. Besides, he gets me this great speed, you know? A girl needs a lift. Plus, it makes you really wild in bed. Shut up! Why'd he do this to you, this dead prick, Wayne? I told him I was in love with somebody else. I told him about me and you, Tony, and then he hit There me. is no you and me. <laughs> Christ, you're killing me. Where is this Wayne? He deals at a bar down in Chinatown. I love you, Tony Cipriani. However, Tony was a loyal and dedicated man to Salvatore's organization, and as a result would consistently reject Maria's advances and only act to keep her safe as per his boss's orders. When it becomes apparent that Wayne would be an issue if left unchecked, Tony would eliminate him the only way he knew how, permanently. Despite confessing her love to Tony and making it clear she desired him, Tony wouldn't even budge after eliminating Wayne for her, and as a result, or perhaps simply out of habit, Maria would return to taking all manner of hard drugs, and once again require the aid of her husband's favorite soldier. Oh, hey baby! Oh, I thought you'd never make it! What is wrong with you? <laughs> nothing, baby, it's all good. Get up, you crazy bitch! What have you taken now? Taken now? Nothing much, you know, a couple of, a couple of greens, a couple of heavy reds. Oh, and these great pills I'm getting from Holland now, pure as hell. I feel great. No, I don't. 
I need a zap and I'll be fine. They're here somewhere. What's a zap? A zap? You don't know what a zap is? Ah, oh, Sody, you are so square. <laughs> Come on, Sony. make sense. I need a zap, Tony. I'm gonna die. I felt like this before. I've OD'd. Get me a zap, Tony. I left him at the diner at Callahan Point. Well, don't just sit there, eh? Come on. Knowing he had little choice but to help the hapless junkie, Tony would drag Maria around town, attempting to locate her stash of zap, only to end up in the wrong place at the wrong time, or rather, multiple times. Why have you brought me here? My stuff isn't here. This is where Wayne used to hang out. I remember, I got some zap stashed in Hepburn Heights. Hey, it's that big Maria, and that's the fuck who killed Wayne. Metal is the while dodging vengeful bikers, Maria and Tony would drive all across Portland, checking her stash in Hepburn Heights, only to wind up back at Maria's apartment, and eventually, Salvatore's mansion. Upon finally coming down off her high, or coming to her senses regarding the cash-strapped Tony, Maria would finally end her attempts to seduce him, and even try to frame the situation as her rejecting him, despite all evidence to the contrary. What kind of driver are you? That took ages! I could have od On the map! I'm gonna need a new wardrobe, a little nip and tuck to work. Honey, have you got some money? Uh, not really. Well, what the hell have you been coming on to me for? I'm Salvatore's girl. He's loaded. Don't you ever hit on me again. Seemingly no longer interested in Tony, Maria would return to life with Salvatore, which consisted of mostly fighting, both physical and verbal, and little else. Already upset enough having to deal with union problems at the Portland docks, Salvatore would have a particularly nasty fight with Maria shortly after her attempted affair with Tony. Shut up, you ungrateful bitch! I'll knock you into next week if I hear another word from you! Oh, that's right, big dick. What are you gonna do, hit me? Why, I oughta... That's the only time you touch me these days! Why the fuck would I want to touch you? I don't like used goods. You revolt me. Me? Revolt you? What? Yeah, revolt! Oh, please. You know what? My daddy was right when he said you were nothing but a fat Yeah, ball. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Tony. I want my money, old man. Get out of here, you tramp. Hey, Anthony, you're an angel of mercy. Women, what are you gonna do about them, huh? Luckily, I can trust someone in my life. You, Tony. You're very important to me. Did I ever tell you that? You can't even get it up, you old bastard. Not for you! I don't like using public toilets, you slut! Very important. So listen, it's you and me now. We're in charge. We got those fools on the run. How would you know? You're more interested in hanging out with men. And you're only happy when you got your drawers around your ankles and your back against the wall. Christ, I met rabbits who like to fuck less than you. So listen, fuck this is you, important. Fuck you, Salvatore Leone, you no-dick, bullying, wife-beating piece of a Fuck me! Shit. Fuck you! In fact, everyone has! Anyway, I got a shipment of you-know-what coming in. This is gonna put us, you and me, on the map big time. Everything should run smooth. I just need someone, someone I trust, to take care of things for me. All right, Tony? I'll talk to you later. And another thing, I never met a girl with hydraulic underwear. It amazes me. Christ, why did I marry her? I was looking for a tramp, I married a slut. I must have really pissed someone off in my past life. I'll tell you that much. However, as would become fairly commonplace, even a fight of this magnitude would mean practically nothing to the two, who had become entirely used to each other's abuse. Mere days after their spat, Maria and Sal would be seemingly right back to normal, clubbing together despite Maria's continued distaste for her elderly husband. Hey, Sal. Tony, what do you think of the new car? She's a beauty, huh? Fully loaded, top of the line. What's that smell? Oh, yeah, midlife crisis. Shut up. Tony, listen, I got a shitload of money that needs to be picked up from my warehouse down at Callahan Point. I don't trust anyone else to do this. Are you girls gonna talk all day, or are we driving? God damn it, woman. Did I tell you you could speak?
By 2001, Maria would move back into Salvatore's mansion on the edge of the St. Mark's district, though their marriage would hardly improve. Despite now being the effective kings of crime in Portland since the destruction of Fort Staunton in 98, the Leones, Salvatore included, would begin to rest on their laurels, and an already easily bored Maria would begin to get restless. With their marriage still in the dumps, Maria would take an almost immediate liking to one of Salvatore's new soldiers, who had begun making a name for himself working for the likes of Luigi Godarelli and Salvatore's son, Joey. The New Blood, a silent criminal handyman by the name of Claude, would arrive in Liberty in 2001 following a less than mutual breakup with his ex-girlfriend Catalina, which landed him in a paddy wagon en route to an upstate Liberty prison. Having proved himself to Salvatore's men, Claude would be given an opportunity to do the same to Salvatore, and the Don's first task for him would be to accompany Maria on one of her many adventures around the city. Fellas need to talk business, so you're going to look after my girl for the evening. Hey, Maria! Move your butt! Dumb bird does this every time. And here she is, the one and only Queen of Sheba. What were you doing up there? Whatever it was, I bet it cost me money. Well, you don't think I hang around here for the conversation, do you? Get in the car and keep your big mouth shut. Take the limo, but bring it back in one piece, you hear me? And watch her. She can be trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure your new lapdog has everything covered. And isn't he big and strong? Hey, Fido, let's go visit Chico and get some party treats. He's at the rail station at the Chinatown waterfront, I think. Being a loyal man who always followed orders without question, Claude would silently chauffeur Maria to her dealer Chico along the waterfront, while Maria prepared to get her metaphorical freak on. If more people would join the military, this would be Mira a is my favorite lady. You're looking for some These fun? A little... Mm -hmm. Hey Chico, nah, just the usual. Here's your butt, lady. Hey, maybe you should check out the warehouse party at the East End of Atlanta Keys. Thanks, Chico. See you around. Gracias. And enjoy. That's what's going After learning of a party taking place in Atlantic Keys, Maria would task Claude with driving her there. But unfortunately for both of them, the party would be broken up by LCPD SWAT teams on a tip from an anonymous source. Thanks to Claude's expert driving, Maria had managed to escape the party unscathed and thoroughly impressed. You know, I enjoyed myself for the first time in a long while. And you, you know, you treated me really good with respect and everything. Well, I better go. <laughs> I'll see you around, I hope. While Claude didn't know it at the time, it was following this encounter that she would develop feelings for the silent Reaper man, feelings that would ultimately lead to her husband's untimely demise. During another of their infamous fights, presumably, Maria would confess her love for Claude to Salvatore, or at the very least lie about them being in a relationship together, despite never interacting outside of his work for her husband. Enraged and unwilling to stand for a betrayal within his organization, Salvatore would plan to have Claude assassinated, inviting him to his mansion after his successful destruction of a Colombian drug lab to celebrate after one last job. It's my favorite cleaner! I'm proud of you, my boy. You kicked the shit out of those grease balls. I just got one little job for you before we can all celebrate. There's a car around the block from Luigi's club. The inside is covered in brains. We gotta help some guy make up his mind and it proved a little uh, messy. Take it to the crusher before the cops find it. Claude, none the wiser to Maria's idiocy, would proceed towards the target vehicle in the red light district, but luckily receive a page from her just in time to save his life. Meeting her at the docks in Callahan Point, Maria would reveal her mistake, and tell Claude his only hope to survive now would be to flee with her and her friend Asuka Kassen of the Torrington-based Yakuza to Staunton Island. Listen, Salvatore thinks that we're going behind his back, so he was offering you to the cartel in order to make a deal. I couldn't let him do that. I mean, the worst thing is, it's all my fault because I told him we were an item. Don't ask me why. I don't know. Look, you're a marked man on the Mafia turf, and I've got to get out of here, too. I've seen too much killing, too much blood. I... This is a friend of mine, okay? She's an old friend. It's, it's so good. She's someone we can trust. Come on, enough of the speeches. We better get out of here before we get more hysterical Italians wanting less friendly reunions. Being a man who went wherever the wind carried him, Claude would not object and would accompany Maria and Asuka to Asuka's condo in Newport, where the women would take a moment to rest while Claude hit the streets to do what he did best. Asuka and I are going to have to talk. Uh, why don't you go cruise around? You'll need a place to lie low. There's a warehouse at the edge of Belleville that should suit your needs. Come back here to my condo when you're ready, and you and me can have a little chat. Now living together in Asuka's condo, Maria and her old friend would catch up on old times, having not seen each other for presumably many years, while Asuka worked with Claude to ensure his ties to the Leones were severed for good. 
We have certain issues to clear up before we continue any form of relationship, business or otherwise. Let's lay our cards on the table. I am Yakuza, and I know you worked for Salvatore Leone's family. I can give you work with our organization, but first you must prove to me that your ties with the Mafia are truly broken. Salvatore Leone will be leaving Luigi's in about three hours' time. Make sure he doesn't reach his club alive. Meanwhile, Maria and I will catch up on old times. Oh, Asuka, you've got a massager. That's not a massager. Around this time, Maria, now a widow, would spend most of her time with Asuka and fretting over Claude, whom she viewed as her new boyfriend, even though he'd never spoken a word to her or shown even the slightest bit of interest in her romantically. In fact, Maria would worry so much about what Claude thought of her that she would call up the Chatterbox radio program hosted by Laszlo Jones in 2001, following Salvatore's assassination. After insulting her gracious host a number of times, as is nearly tradition for all programs Laszlo has ever been on, Maria would ask him how to know if a guy is interested, to which Jones responded with his typical sarcasm. All right, let's go over to here to line 79. Hello, you're on Chatterbox. Hello, uh, is that Laszlo? Uh, yes. <sighs> oh, well, I'm on the radio. How, how exciting. Oh, thank you, Laszlo. Um, is this on the radio? I mean, am, am I actually on the radio right this second? Uh, uh, yes, you are. Uh, I'm sure it's very exciting for you, but uh, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> oh, man, I mean, what, what, what else is there? I could go on all day, but well, you know how it is, don't you, Laszlo? Uh, not really. I mean, what's your name? What do you call about? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm Maria, you know, Maria, like Mamma Mia, only, only different, you know, but, you know, men, M-E-N, <laughs> it's a dirty word, only there's only three letters, you, you know what I mean? I mean, your broadcasters are all the same, aren't you? I mean, I heard about you, you're always out on boys' nights. Whoa, 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 what are you talking about? I, I, I'm married. Uh, one of those convenience jobs to protect you, I bet? I know what you're all like. You know more about men than I know about leopard skin furniture. So, less of that clever stuff and give me some advice. I mean, come on, I got real problems. You see, okay, I had this boyfriend. And at first, he was real kind to me. He was a real gentleman. A little bit older and everything, but you know, he treated me really good. And then it all went wrong. And so, you know, I found someone else. And he seems real nice, but, you know, he don't talk too much. So, I really can't tell if he likes me. And, well, I guess what I want to know is... How do you tell if a guy is serious? I mean, you know, he treats me good, but he don't seem real interested in me. You know, he's always working and hanging out with the guys. Um, say, you don't think he's like you, do you? What do you mean, like me? What are you insinuating? Th that he's on the radio? Well, probably not. When not calling into radio shows, Maria would be, we believe, engaging in various acts of BDSM with Asuka, though this remains entirely speculative. However, given the two's reported history and alleged conversations between them, it seems likely that at the very least, their relationship was not entirely platonic. It's my handsome handyman. Maria's all tied up at the moment, but I'll tell her you call. Dad, it's been you know, I know I've been a naughty girl, but I really need to pee, okay? It's time you met our man inside the LPD. Here's a payment for the last little job he did for us. He is understandably cautious. Get to the payphone in Torrington as quick as you can, and await his instructions. Maria would even accompany Asuka in apparently all or some of her Yakuza dealings at the time, following Asuka as she attempted to win a gang war with the Colombians and avenge the death of her brother Kenji, whom neither woman knew was actually killed by Claude. In a rare, overt demonstration of her sadistic streak, Maria would even accompany Asuka to the Panlanta construction site, where the Yakuza leader was torturing cartel leader Miguel which Maria happily participated in. Do we tighten it some more now or just wait for it to turn black and fall off? Give it a quick prod. Oh, what is that gooey yellow stuff? Oh, hey, babe! My handyman. I, I was bored, so I came over to keep a suit of company. She's got the makings of a natural, this girl. She's managed to extract this little gem from our guest. There's a plane coming into Francis International in two hours' time. It is full of Catalina's poison. You can avoid airport security by getting a boat out to the runway light buoys and shooting the plane down on its approach. Collect the cargo from the debris and stash it. Oh, you be careful now, okay, baby? Now try the chili oil. 
In fact, Maria seemed not only to enjoy torturing Miguel, but to be a natural, according to Asuka, at interrogation. However, despite any chutzpah she might have had, it wouldn't be enough to match the considerably crazier Catalina, when she arrived along with presumably dozens of cartel soldiers to assault the construction site. Though exactly how the encounter played out remains debated, it would end with Asuka Kassen dead, along with Miguel, and Maria kidnapped to be used as bait in Catalina's ultimate goal of eliminating the handsome handyman once and for all. Nobody quite knows why, given Claude's apparent indifference to Maria, but for whatever reason, he would actually arrive to pay Catalina's ransom at the cartel-controlled mansion in Cedar Grove. Bueno, pa que es idiot? One of these scarface idiots. Did you turn up to rescue Maria or to get me back? Well, I got news for you. Shooting you will be a pleasure, but dating you was only business. You are muy pequeñito, amigo. Throw over the cash and you can have this overused puta back. You have been a busy boy, but you haven't learned. I'm not to be trusted. Kill the idiot! Apparently never learning his lesson when it came to his ex-girlfriend, Claude would naively assume the exchange to be in good faith, and subsequently be left to die while Catalina fled to her escape chopper, with Maria still in tow. For some reason. However, despite getting the drop on Claude again, this time Catalina would not be able to run fast enough to escape the wrath of her ex-boyfriend. Claude would pursue her chopper all the way to Cochrane Dam, and eventually kill her and all of her cartel guards, rescuing Maria, and finally finding closure on the betrayal which consumed him for so long. Residents in Cedar Grove have been coming to terms with the emotional aftermath of a full-blown war that hit the area yesterday. Local resident Clive Denver described to police a single gunman that he saw fleeing the scene with a dark-haired woman. Oh, you know, we're gonna have such fun, because, you, know, you know, I love you. I, I, I really do, because you're such a big, strong man, and that's just what I mean. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, you know, I forget, but you know what it's like, don't you? The sound of explosions shook nearby homes as people ran for cover. Several citizens were injured in the panic as gunfire was exchanged between ground forces and a helicopter circling the dam. Yeah, we got a good view from down here in the gardens. When the copter finally got taken out, better than the fireworks on the 4th of July. With the death toll already over 20, police are still finding bodies. There have been no official denials concerning rumors that the dead were members of the Colombian cartel and still no leads as to the cause of the massacre. Can you believe it? This one cost me $50. What became of Maria Latore remains a matter of great contention among criminal historians in Liberty City. Many contend that following the chaotic Battle of Cochrane Dam, Claude murdered Maria along with everyone else present, possibly to keep her from connecting him to the crime, or possibly simply out of annoyance. However, there are also a great many historical sources who claim that there is no real evidence that Maria was killed that night, also citing the lack of any corpses matching her description being found in the lengthy investigation which followed unlike the many dozens of Colombian bodies who were found. We will never truly know what became of her, but whatever the case, following her involvement with Claude, she would vanish from the criminal and historical record, with no further information existing on her post-2001. We may never know the truth. Maria Latore was an incredibly materialistic and shallow person, the majority of the time. Motivated by lust, wealth, and heavy drugs, she rarely acted in ways which did not directly suit her own interests, which were often self-destructive in nature. From a young age, Maria seemed to view herself as a trophy to be won by the various men who vied for her attention, and also seemed to be explicitly attracted to those who would forego this interest. 
While it isn't known if her upbringing was one of wealth and status, Maria was quite used to getting what she wanted, especially when it came to men, making those she could not obtain with ease all the more alluring, such as Tony Cipriani or Claude. While seemingly emotionally and sexually motivated by the chase, at the end of the day, Maria was no fool and knew the value of money, attaching herself to the likes of Salvatore Leone and his immense resources whilst continuing to sleep with whomever she pleased, the best of both worlds. Maria may have also been bisexual, as many believe that she had relations with the likes of Asuka Kassem, and possibly other women, though this is not confirmed with any certainty. Married to Salvatore for approximately nine years, Maria seemed more than willing to employ violence through her mafia connections, if it served to benefit her, vaguely threatening the likes of Liberty Tree reporter Ned Burner, or effectively setting Cedric Fotheringay up to be killed, showing zero remorse. She also had a sadistic streak, participating happily in the graphic torture and interrogation of Miguel without showing the slightest bit of hesitation, and setting her own husband up for assassination by her new boyfriend without shedding a single tear. In addition, Maria was also apparently a kleptomaniac, and arguably a junkie, who stole on a regular basis, simply for the thrill of it, having no shortage of resources available to her to pay for whatever her heart desired, yet somehow winding up nearly $100,000 in debt to her speed dealer. Some might describe Maria as ditzy, though they would not be entirely incorrect, it would be a mistake to assume she was all body and no brains. Maria seemed to always know exactly what her actions would result in, and seemed to almost revel in watching others deal with the scenarios she was responsible for creating. At the end of the day, though, when Maria Latore is compared to most subjects we have examined on this program, she might as well be an angel. Not directly responsible for murdering or even ordering the death of anyone, but instead responsible for making egregious but ultimately human mistakes that led to the deaths of many people around her, even if she didn't intend for it. However, we speculate that the main thing which kept Maria from being a truly repugnant criminal herself was ambition, and not a lack of ability or tolerance for violence. Far happier to kick her feet up, pop several different pills, and drift away into a blissful nirvana, Maria was never interested in taking names the way men like Salvatore, Claude, or Tony were, and instead vicariously lived through their actions, observing with sadistic glee. Though heavily associated with the Leone crime family and later the Yakuza, Maria Latore herself has a substantially shorter rap sheet than most subjects we have examined here on GTA Biographies. While Maria was never arrested to our knowledge, even if she had been, it's likely her connections would have meant a short stay in a city jail before returning to her luxurious lifestyle. That being said, we here at Weasel will always try to bring you the facts as we see them, and though not able to stand shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder crime wise to the likes of Claude, or even her late husband, we believe there were plenty of charges that could have been attributed to Maria herself, starting with Stealing from the Portland View branch of the Signora Grande Italian Boutique Stealing from a shop in Chinatown and possibly being present for Tony's murder of the store clerk Accessory murder when requiring Tony's assistance to escape her kidnappers Accessory to an illegal street race when putting herself up as a prize in a bike race around Callahan Point. Conspiracy accessory murder when informing Tony of Cedric Fotheringay's whereabouts, who is subsequently killed. Purchasing illegal drugs and accessory murder when requiring Tony's assistance during a particularly bad trip, resulting in the deaths of many bikers. Purchasing illegal drugs and evading authorities when a rave she attends is crashed by LCPD SWAT teams. Accessory attempted murder when unintentionally getting a hit placed on Claude by her husband. Conspiracy accessory murder when knowing about Asuka and Claude's plan to murder Salvatore Leone. And the torture and interrogation of former cartel leader, Miguel. As you can see, Maria Latore, while far from the worst of the worst on GTAB, was hardly an angel, responsible for the deaths of many, and prone to stealing out of habit. Maria's criminal surroundings would either bleed into her own personality, or simply mesh well with her existing narcissism, and her desires to have things her way at all times. Perhaps in another life, under slightly different circumstances, or perhaps if she had simply not married Salvatore Leone, she may have been your average, ordinary Libertonian woman, seeking thrills and stimulation in the worst city in America. When you're surrounded by as many crazy, psychotic, and violent individuals as Maria was, you would hardly be surprised when you find yourself joining them, because you certainly can't beat them.
what is it that creates people capable of brushing off such destructive acts of violence without a second thought? Is it cities like Liberty and Las Venturas? Dens of vice and criminality so alluring that even the most wholesome among us might be tempted by their malicious appeal? Or perhaps it is simply certain people who inevitably gravitate towards a life of rebellion and carefree corruption. We may never know for sure, but one thing that I know is that America is a dangerous place. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that middle-aged white woman ahead of you in line complaining to the manager is secretly the wife of a mobster prepared to cut off all of your precious toes. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all of my patrons for making this series possible. And a special thank you to my very first executive producer patron, XX Anti Tricks Never Sorry 17. Myself and the Weasel News Network couldn't be more thankful for your contributions.